This morning we have a really, really good uh, resource speaker here today, Bill Boggs. Bill is the correspondent for the PBS TV show My Generation, an author, a four-time Emmy-winning TV host and executive producer, here to present success strategies that will help you to find the greatness within yourself. Please give a warm welcome to Bill Boggs. For the purpose of what I'm talking about today, for the next few minutes, what is my definition of success? Well, if you write a book about success and you're on the radio a couple hundred times, everybody wants to know, how do you find su define success? My definition is getting the best out of yourself one day at a time. Getting the best out of yourself one day at a time. As leaders, in order to lead others, First, you have to be able to lead yourself. And Benjamin Franklin, who, by the way, was not available to be interviewed for my book, said, he who cannot obey cannot command. So that is not a convoluted thing. When I say getting the best out of yourself one day at a time is my definition of success. If you're a leader, the first person you want to be able to lead is to lead yourself in order to get the best out of yourself one day at a time. So my next question to ask you is this, and there's one key in this sentence, and this is the, maybe the most important of all this series of questions I'm asking at this point, okay? What can I do? How's my exchange rate? What can I do to improve the value of each day for myself, knowing that that day will never come again? Now just do me a favor, just close your eyes and think. Because the key is improve. How's my exchange rate? What can I do to improve the value of each day for myself, knowing that that day will never come again? Now just focus on that. Questions are more powerful than answers. So about a month goes by, and I am really getting frustrated, and I'm building up deep resentment. Deep resentment. And you can write this one down, my friends. Resentment is like taking poison and waiting for the other person to die. <laughs> it does you no good. So in the next couple of minutes of the talk, what I want to do is I want to run through some of the things that the 44 people whom I interviewed and, and the other people whom I've been taking notes on shared with me about their success. Shared with me about their success. So all this is essentially coming, whether it's coming from Trump or, or Branson or whoever, these are things that these people unanimously felt were part of the reasons that helped make them successful. And the first was the ability to adapt and change. Adapt and change. Now look at your business right now. Look at that triple crown thing, your success, your adversity, your happy life. Change is inevitable. Change is inevitable. Growth from that change is optional. Change is inevitable. Growth from that change is optional. And look at your companies. You know, normally, when, sometimes when I do this talk, I do a more interactive version. And I might turn to you and say, by the way, how do you deal with somebody in your organization who is really resistant to change? We all know what they're like, you know? They're sitting there, they don't want to move forward, they don't want to grow, and that can be a very poisonous thing. So it's very important to be aware of the people in your organization and to have a methodology in your organization making you a better leader to deal with the people in the organization who do not want to change. I think adaptability is so critical, really in any period, but particularly the period that we're in right now. Because the economy is changing. Everything is changing. So I think right now we all need to look inside to figure out what are our skill sets and where are the holes in those skill sets. And I think in order to survive and hopefully thrive in this new environment, in this changed environment, we need to figure out what 
we are lacking. It could be uh, that we need training. Lacking. Absolutely. We, it could be we need new training. I mean, you would not want your doctor to stop learning. You want your doctor to keep up with all the innovations. Unfortunately, that's happening in every industry. There's amazing change happening, and we need to figure out what it will take to thrive and survive in those industries. So what are our skill sets? What are the holes in our skill sets? I think that's another very important question to ask from a, a business strategy standpoint, from a, a leadership strategy standpoint. John Wooten, the legendary basketball coach, said about the subject, um, failure is not fatal. Failure to change may be fatal. I come back and I sit down and start the show again. And wouldn't you know, the first words out of one of the prostitutes' mouth were, you know, Bill, I was a brownie when I was a little girl. <laughs> she was trying to help me out. Well, anyway, the show is over, and I, I get called into the boss's office, right? He says, Bill, what happened? You went nuts. You went nuts in the air today. You went crazy. I said, I know, you know, I know I should have done it. He said, let, look, look, let, let's see what we can learn from this. This is why I'm telling you the story. Then he said, and what are you going to do about your coworkers? Now, this is, this is your lesson. What are you going to do about your coworkers? And I said, oh, I, I don't know. What should I do? He said, well, don't you understand the effect that you have had on them? No. He said, well, Bill, don't you understand that every day when you walk in the studio, you're the star of the show, you are a leader in that regard. The lesson that I learned was simply this, and this is why I like to share this with leaders like you. He said, every day when you walk in the studio, the energy you give off is infectious. Now, you know that as leaders, as, as heads of your companies, as a professional communicator. I wanna share a couple of things that I think are really important in your organizations, and that also overlap into your home life about communicating. The first and most important thing that I want to stress here is one word, and it is the value of listening. The value of listening, right? When you're talking to a coworker, when you're talking to somebody who works under you, whatever it is, if you're really listening to them, or if you're at an event like this and you're networking, whatever we want to call, you know, essentially learning from each other here, if you're listening to somebody, it's not a passive act. Listening requires energy. If you, Bob Iger, president of Disney, said to me, if you want someone to be more interested in you, spend more time listening to them. It's a very important point. If you want somebody to be more interested in you, spend more time listening to them. And in these days when we have so many distractions of cell phones and things like that, the art of listening, I think, is something that really is falling away. Listen with intention of understanding. Don't listen with intention of responding. Big, big difference. How many, you know, someone is talking, I notice this with my son all the time, honestly. He'll be talking to me and I'm already thinking what I want to tell him and I, wait a second, stop. Listen with the intention of understanding rather than with the intention of responding. And I thought, how can I use my TV talk show question writing skills to essentially you know, give you something from my world that could be helpful to you? So I wrote out a couple of questions that I think I'd like you to make, consider trying when you get back to the workplace uh, next week. Two things happen when you ask these questions. The first is you get information about your workplace that you may not have known. And second, and most really importantly, the second thing that happens is that you are validating people. The very fact that you as the boss, the leader, goes up to someone and asks them a question about their life, their work, you are essentially validating that person. So I don't know if you want to take notes or write these down, but here they are. <coughs> Walk around the, com the company and say, I'm not talking about gossip here, but what's, what's going on? I've been very busy working on X, Y, or Z. What's going on in the company that you don't think I know about? You will get really interesting answers to that question. And you also validate, say you're talking to Judy. Hey, Judy, you know, I've been busy. What's going on in the company you don't think I know about here? Judy's going to go and say to her husband, you're not going to believe it. He came over and asked me today, and I was able to explain, you know, or an even better one. Tell me, Ralph, I'm just curious. I'm trying to 
find out more about you know, what's really going on with our people here. What do you do in your job that's not part of your job description? What do you do in your job that's not part of your job description? You know what you're, you're getting there? Essentially what you're getting there is information from Ralph that you should know. And at the same time, Ralph goes home and says to Judy, because they're married, right? Says, you know, you're not going to believe me. <laughs> Ralph and Judy. <laughs> that you're not going to believe what happened. The boss came over today and wanted to know, and I finally got to explain this, right? The single greatest source of bitterness in the workplace comes from people going to work day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, without somebody saying, hey, Fred, you're doing a good job. You know, company, you're really helping out the company. So it's really important, challenging you here, you have to have something in place in your organizations to let people know they're doing a good job, right? You have to let, have something in place to let people know that they're doing a good job. So question, what am I doing about that? How am I validating my people? If your answer is, I really don't have a system, work on, work on getting one, work on getting one. Another story, and this is a non-political story, but a hugely successful person, Ronald Reagan. Now here's a guy who was a successful movie star, president of SAG, a giant union, eight years California governor, eight years president of the United States. What a successful life. And his official biographer, in other words, wrote the bi biography commissioned by Ron and Nancy, lived in my building in New York. And so when I interviewed him, I'm always interested, I'm not interested in the politics, I'm interested in the internal components. Tell me some things about Reagan that made him the successful man he was. Well, he was an optimist. He was willfully optimistic. He had this sunny disposition. People wanted to be around him. He drew people, he drew the best people around him. And he was the master of the personal touch. Well, give me a story. Well, here's one that's not in the book. If you look at the, the guy's career, from the, in the 30s, he was getting fan mail. And some people, some women primarily, who were teenage girls, started writing him in the 30s, continued to write him, because there was huge attrition, all the way up to his second term as president of the United States. And he would write back, okay, you know, if he got the note, it might take a little while, they would get a note back. So one of these women who started out as a teenager is now in Washington with a granddaughter and her, her own daughter, and they're touring all the different things. And one morning she gets up and says, She's getting all dressed up in her best gray suit. What are you doing, Grandma? How come you're so dressed up? Well, I'm going over to the White House. I've been writing to Ronald Reagan for 51 years, and I want him to know that I'm here. Well, what, are you crazy, Grandma? No, he should know that I'm here. And she takes out her stationery with her initials on it and writes a handwritten note. And this is before people were sneaking into the White House parties, right? She just goes over and goes to the man at the gate, explains who she is very nicely. She doesn't look like a wacko gives him the note, and because of the culture that's created in that specific organization, that White House, he says, okay, we'll sit here in the shade, it's like a gazebo out there. The note goes inside. So the note goes to the you know, communications room with the, under, you know, the phone call from the guard, and that person doesn't really know what to do with it, so it goes upstairs. Now it's on the second floor. One thing leads to another, and after about 20 minutes, that note is now open, and it's on the desk of Ronald Reagan's secretary who's outside the Oval Office, she knows immediately who this woman Nellie is, right? And she has to make a decision. So she looks in the Oval Office, she sees, you know, they're not planning to invade Grenada, you know, things are relatively <laughs> secure. So she goes in up to the president and says, I mean, Nellie is out at the beginning, they say, Nellie? That Nellie is here? Yeah. And then the story goes, Reagan gets this tremendous twinkle in his eye. He says, guys, give me a couple of minutes. And he instructs somebody to go out to the gazebo and walk her to the front door of the White House, right? And on cue, Reagan has come downstairs on cue. Reagan opens the door and says, Nellie, you're finally here! <laughs> the value, the art of the personal touch. And let me just conclude by saying, that first of you have been an extraordinarily attentive audience. I could feel you're listening to me, and I appreciate that. Um, that I had no idea when I was that little kid listening to that little white radio that I would ever be so lucky to be so close, right, to so many incredible people, 
and be able to see and absorb firsthand how each of them seemed to possess a will to prevail by believing in their God-given talents and that they had a force with them because they knew how powerful that faith in themselves could be, whether the times for them were good or bad, which should remind us all. And this is really the centerpiece of my talk and the centerpiece of my book. You are very powerful, provided you know how powerful you are.